I would like to thank the organizers for giving us this, giving me this opportunity to remind you about the next conference that we will be organizing. Uh, it will be in Lisbon uh, next year, so at the Academy of Science of Lisbon. Uh, the Academy, well, is already 224 years old, and you can see here the main, the main hall, and it is housed in a former convent of Jesus of 17th century. And in fact, the building resisted to very heavy earthquake we had in 1755. And that you can see the motto of the academy in Latin, but that means what, if what we do is not useful, then the glory is in vain. Uh, this is another is, is session, sessions meeting room. And there is a nice cloister where we can go around and have coffee breaks. And the academy is rich in azulejos, in these tiles, hand-painted, yeah. it's full of them around the building. Also has a, a museum, and with some very old books like this one, this atlas of the 16th century on the left, and also a, a very interesting book about the Armadas, Portuguese Armadas in 15th and 16th centuries, that you can see they are represented in a very clear way. There was a fire on that one <laughs> that you can see in the bottom, yeah. So that was represented, and then others yeah, around. And we are in Spain, and so I've selected this example as well. It's the Chronicles of the Kings of Spain. It's a, a huge publication, yeah, very heavy, and from 16th and 17th century. I think is unique. Well, these pieces are unique in the, in the world, I think. Well, concerning our, our symposium, we suggested last week of October, because in this one it will not overlap, in this case it will not overlap with the, the meeting of the Academia Europaia, yeah, that will be earlier, and also because it is a common, a common period for Eurasian conferences. And uh, we suggest Monday, Tuesday, 28th and 29th, or Tuesday, Wednesday. And so, uh, whenever you see a highlight a red highlight, I would appreciate your comments on that. Not now, we have no time, but just let me know later and also our president. Uh, I suggest to avoid Thursday, because Thursday is the day where are the ordinary meetings of our academy. So it will be easier if we do not interfere with that. Yeah. And the last, uh, last one, Friday, well, Friday is a holiday, it's 1st of November. It's a holiday in Portugal, it's a religious holiday, and so I think we should also avoid it. Uh, we have already provisional organizing and scientific committees. Well, you can see the names there. It's very provisional, so other names can join us. And then concerning the program, of course, we will have half a day dedicated to prizes and uh, to the award ceremony. Now, concerning the themes. Here, really, we appreciate very much your suggestions on this. So, in principle, we should uh, focus on uh, scientific fields uh, corresponding to the Eurasic division, but fields that are promoting sustainability. So we have chemistry, computation, information science, and so on, on alphabetic order. I did not put on any spe specific order yet. So also social science and humanities towards sustainability. So suggestions would be very welcome. Speakers, the same, yeah. We need names. And this is an opportunity also for our ask to interact and promote collaboration with other European institutions like ALIA, EASAC, SAPEA, uh, ERC, EIC, I don't know. Uh, in some cases, uh, I remember last, well, the, the previous meeting also had somebody from ERC and EIC, but now, well, we can continue or, or spread to other institutions. Uh, another possibility could be the publication of the invited lectures in the memories of the Academy of Science. It's a, a regular uh, uh, book, let us say, of publications of our Academy. It's also a question mark, and so uh, I'm just asking this possibility. Concerning the social program, well, of course, the conference dinner, uh, first day, like in this case. Uh, the Academy of Science has a rich museum that uh, I suggest we visit it. And now with a question mark, should we dedicate a half day for an excursion? Because Lisbon, as I will show you very soon, really is very attractive and also the surroundings. But this probably would require the extension of the symposium for two days and a half, unless we, we leave this social program for, for the last day. 
uh, concerning the sponsors. We really appreciate also your suggestions because, of course, we have sponsors, uh, our academies and uh, chemical society and other scientific societies in Portugal, but they do not. They sponsor, uh, but they do not sponsor financially. They support, they support mentally, let us say. Yeah. And uh, we need, we need is financial support. Yeah. And uh, remember one thing, the higher the financial spons sponsorship, the lower, of course, will be the registration fee. And so your suggestions will be very, very appreciated on this. So concerning Lisbon itself, the, Lisbon, I think, is the only capital in Europe where the airport is inside of the town. It's really inside. It's not in the suburbs. It's really inside. And it can be reached by the, uh, you can see here, I have no pointer, but from the airport. You can see the airport on top. And the ACL is the Academy of Science on the bottom left. It's between two trains, the two metro stations, Rato and the other one, Vaixa uh, Rossi. And so it's very easy to, to, to find it. Uh, Lisbon is a hilly town, yeah, and the area where is the academy is also considerably hilly. But there is a trick, yeah, because when you arrive to the academy, if you use the Rato station, then you go down to the academy. And when you finish your session, you should not go back to Rato, uh, unless you want to do some exercise. But then you go to the other one, to Baixa Rossi, and you also go down there. And so it is very easy, and you, uh, without any effort, you can go and return from, from the academy. Um, well, don't forget that Lisbon has been a worthy of many uh, awards in the last few years. For instance, Europe's leading destination several times in recent years. And Lisbon is very light. It's full of light. Sky really is beautiful, usually. Uh, very nice blue, and you can visit, uh, well, uh, monuments, as you can see, Tower of Blaine of 16th century, uh, to celebrate the discoveries, of the, 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 the Portuguese discoveries, yeah. and uh, the Geronimus, Monastery of Geronimus, also 16th century, but the, the top one is recent one, well, recent is 20th century, also to to celebrate the same. Then, this is a modern part of the town on the east part, yeah, where you have here one of the best oceanariums in the world. And uh, one of the best, probably the best old coach museums in the world is, is in Lisbon. Yeah? And you have other museums, yeah? and also the, an aqueduct, a very heavy aqueduct that also resisted the earthquake of 1755. And, uh, uh, well, cultural uh, centers and so on. And for those who like music and songs, yeah, you have the Fado. That's very typical from Lisbon and has been classified by UNESCO as World Heritage. Yeah. So you can see the Fado. On the right is Fado of Coimbra, of the students of the University of Coimbra, but the most typical one is that on the left of Lisbon. And surrounding Lisbon, you have Sintra, it's a very, very beautiful place with fantastic uh, monuments there, palaces that you can visit. Cape of Rock, that is the most western point of continental Europe, and you can have a certificate, and you go there and bring a certificate with you. And Arabida Beach, also very nice. And don't forget, of course, our gastronomy, our cod, dried cod, very typical, yeah. And, uh, uh, well, the pastries of Belém on the left, for instance, and, of course, port wine, and that is very, very well known. And we have, uh, you see, it is the, the, the vineyards grow here in the Douro, River Douro Valley. And you can see these terraces yeah, on the hilly banks of the, of the river, of Douro River, and they have also been classified as world heritage. And so, but we have many other wines, types of wines, and including uh, one that is... Vinho Verde, green wine, and so you will be very welcome to taste it and to, 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 to visit the, the Lisbon Academy next year. Thank you very much for your thanks a lot. Thank you. People, and I am quite sure that you will get support from Minister of Science and Technology and Higher Education, by sure. That's very <laughs>
<laughs> okay. And also you spoke about ERC. We just have uh, the, the vice president of ERC is Nectarius that he will be get as our fellow. He could give a panorama about all this, the structure because he also was a president, inter interim president of ERC during some time during the vacature. So he knows the, all the strategy he has on the buildings and maybe worthwhile to understand one of the great pillars on science in Europe. If you want, you can use it. Okay. Okay. You, you, you wish to. I will be here until the end, and so just please feel free or send me by e an email or so. Yeah. So I will be very pleased. We will consider all, all, all suggestions. Yes. Okay, thank you. So now we. We will carry on, um, and so we are on the section number six, and um, we will attribute the material science Bless Pascal Medal, and uh, the presenter will be Thomas Torres Cebada, please. Dear President and Vice President of the European Academy of Science, their heads of division and representatives, their chairs, chair and member of the organizing committee, their Eurasian fellow, their sirs and madams. Morning, morning to, good morning to everyone. My name is Thomas Torres. I am fellow of the European Academy of Science and professor at the Autonomous University of Madrid and Indian Nanoscience. I am here as representative of the head of Material Science Division, Professor Federico Rossi. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor George Malarias, uh, Georgios Mayaras, who has been awarded with the Material Science Blaise Pascal Medal 2023. He studied physics in Thessaloniki, in Greece, and received his PhD from the University of Groningen, the Netherlands. Then he was postdoctoral fellow at the same university and later at the ABM Almaden Research Center in San Jose, California. Since 1999, during 10 years, he occupied different positions in Cornell University, Ithaca, like Lester Knight, director of Cornell Nanoscale Science and Technology Facility. From 2009 to 2017, he was professor at the École Nationale Supérieure du Maine du Saint-Étienne in France. Currently, he is Prince Phil Professor of Technology at the University of Cambridge since 2017. Uh, professor Maliaras is a pioneer in science and technology of organic electronic materials. He is widely considered as founding father of organic bioelectronics, a field that applies organic electronic materials to biology and medicine. He has made outstanding contribution to material science in areas of organic semiconductor interfaces, organic mix conductors, organic electrochemical transistors, and brain interfaces. These are only a few from the large body of outstanding work that spans over 300 publications. George's work has made a significant impact in the community with more than 41,000 citations. He has an H index of 109, and he has delivered more than 500 invited keynote and plenary lectures. George's achievements has been recognized with an honorary doctorate from the University of Linköping in Sweden and awards for the New York Academy of Science, the U.S. National Science Foundation and DuPont, among others. His work has made significant impact also in the real world. The conducting polymer electrodes he developed are used in the clinic to map the human brain. His work on orthogonal lithography led to the OSCOR product line from orthogonal incorporation and has yielded 
display prototypes with extraordinary resolution. Professor Maliara's deserve without any doubt the Material Science Blaise Pascal Medal 2023. Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Torres, for the very kind introduction. It's great to see you again. Thank you to the uh, members of the Academy for uh, bestowing on me this uh, incredible honor. I'm, I'm deeply, deeply honored by this and uh, humbled to be amongst you. Um, I want to um, talk today about technology for bioelectronic medicine. I will explain what bioelectronic medicine is and why in need of technology. Very. Um, long introduction to make sure we're uh, all on the same uh, wavelength. Um, in short, this is what bioelectronic medicine is, is using the um, uh, tools and techniques of electronics um, to provide outcomes mostly in the um, uh, treatment of symptoms of neurological conditions. This is an example here from Tremor. Uh, which is a, a movement disorder that's characterized by a controlled uncontrolled movement of the extremities and through electrical stimulation of a structure deep in the brain called the subthalamic nucleus, the uh, symptoms uh, show a, a, a major amelioration that enable the patient to function almost normally. And this is one of the examples. The history goes back to ancient times where electric fish were um, used to treat migraines. Apparently they would lower an electric fish on your head and that would uh, cure the migraine. Um, it was Galvani in the 18th century who uh, set the uh, field in a, on a scientific basis, the famous experiments with the dead frog and the application of electricity that gave rise to a twitching of the, uh, the legs. This created a lot of excitement um, and 200 years later, there were medical devices. This is a pacemaker the year before these devices became fully implanted. And at that time, the patient had to carry with them this life-saving cart of batteries and electronics. The first fully implanted device was uh, developed in uh, 58, the Karolinska Hospital in uh, Sweden. So that starts the clock for um, bioelectronic medicine. Um, the um, yellow star shows the location of the intervention here on the heart to treat arrhythmias. A decade later, interventions were happening in the inner ear, in the cochlea, to help people with profound deafness. Then on the spinal cord to uh, um, uh, relieve chronic pain, a couple of peripheral nerve devices, and then in 2000s, the um, uh, emphasis shifted on the brain with deep brain stimulation for neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. And then the floodgates opened and many devices were um, uh, approved by the FDA. This is not a comprehensive list. The latest and greatest is small stimulators that go on the peripheral nerve to treat uh, diseases and disorders that go beyond the spectrum of neurological and into autoimmune, for example, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, are all believed to be treatable um, with this technology. So this is a snapshot of today, uh, different devices that are commercially available, different locations of intervention and different indications. And by and large, these devices look like this. They have a tin can that contains batteries and electronics um, connected to leads with leads to electrodes that are placed in different anatomical location. 
This is the uh, placement for uh, deep brain stimulation. Um, two electrode arrays with four electrodes each placed deep in the brain. And then the uh, connection cables are uh, placed over the, um, uh, the surface of the brain. Um, and the um, little box with batteries and electronics is implanted subcutaneously on the chest and the leads are tunneled under the skin. Now, these are made by hand, which is incredible. Year 2023, and we're using watchmaker technology um, that dates back, you know, centuries. Um, this is the uh, factory at uh, Medel, one of the implant manufacturers, and you see people working through microscopes with little tweezers, putting together small um, uh, uh, electrodes into a mold and making these devices at very low throughput. In microelectronics, we develop things automatically. So this is TSMC, Taiwan Manufacturing Semiconductor Corporation, the largest microelectronics fab in the world. And you see mostly empty, very few people tend to this. It's highly automated using processes such as thin film deposition, where you take a metal, you um, turn it into vapor, and then it condes condenses on the substrate, giving you a film with thickness that's controlled with atomic precision. Through processes such as photolithography and etching, you can um, control the structuring of this film laterally and make devices with incredible precision and amazing reproducibility and throughput and all that. Now, this is very slowly entering into biomedical devices and has led to significant advances. What you see here on the bottom left of the screen is a cortical grid that is used to explore the human brain and map it before surgery. For example, a resection of a tumor or of an epileptogenic zone. And this is a handmade grid. It consists of electrodes that are made out of platinum discs with five millimeters diameter put together with tweezers. Um, and as a result, it offers fairly poor mapping of the brain. This is a lithographically fabricated grid that offers electrodes with 10 micron uh, precision, able to detect single neuronal activity from the underlying uh, brain surface. And it can guide the resection with exceptional precision, much better than the uh, current uh, state of the art. So that is one of the advantages that you can achieve by switching the technology from manual to using the techniques of microelectronics. Turns out you need something more. You need to also couple it with new materials because as you make the electrodes smaller and smaller, their ability to record brain activity diminishes. Um, as we engineers say, their impedance, electrochemical impedance, just shoots up. And by using polymers, conducting polymers such as this one shown here, um, uh, called P.PSS, um, you can ameliorate the, uh, the impedance. You can uh, uh, dramatically decrease it by orders of magnitude and be able to record even um, at, at very small electrodes. The physical phenomenon underlying uh, this process is the volumetric transport of ions. So this conducting polymer looks a little bit like a sponge. It's a spongy structure and ions from the cerebrospinal fluid can enter its structure and then um, interact throughout the volume of the material with electronic charges. So in a sense, you have a mechanism, you have a material that couples electronic charges, which is the signals of biology, sorry, ionic charges, which are the signals of biology, with electronic charges, with, which are the signals of electronics. And um, this cohabitation um, helps you get better transduction of information between electronics and biology. How does the, this phenomenon work? How do electronic and ionic charges talk to each other? We developed an experiment um, that is called the, uh, the moving front. This dates back to work by Aoki in Japan and then um, later on by Elizabeth Smella in the US and Ule Inganas in, in Sweden. Um, 
Yeah. What we did is we uh, developed a one-dimensional version of this experiment according to which this conducting polymer P.PSS is placed between two insulating surfaces and exposed to an electrolyte from one end and then a metal electrode from the other end. And what we do is we apply a potential and bring ions into the material to change its conductivity. Um, and as this process happens, there is a change in the color of the uh, polymer associated with a phenomenon called electrochromism. And we can monitor this um, change of color. As you see on the video, you have this moving front that signifies the transit of ions inside the sample. So we can time the passage of ions and we can extract parameters such as their mobility and be able to understand uh, a bit more quantitatively how this phenomenon works. Um, we can uh, time resolve this uh, chains of uh, optical profile by shining light through the sample and using a CCD camera underneath. And we can fit this data with very simple models that help us extract properties such as um, uh, ionic conductivity and electronic conductivity and so on and so forth. Turns out the physics of this process is very similar to the uh, physics of organic light emitting diodes. These are devices that you have on your cell phone, on your flat panel TV. These are OLED panels that you see here. Um, and um, the physics of these devices was developed in the late 90s and modeled through um, a, an energy level diagram where we consider the uh, organic layer that emits light as a semiconductor with the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital representing valence and conduction band. And then two metal electrodes with their Fermi levels indicated on the, on the uh, diagram injecting electrons and holes. So we describe this phenomena, um, again, late 90s, um, through processes of charge injection, charge transport, and recombination. So what my group has done is we took that know-how and transferred it to electrochemical phenomena. In a similar fashion, when you uh, dope a conducting polymer or, a, or a, a, any conjugated polymer for that matter, you have the polymer at an interface between an electrolyte on one side and a metal electrode on the other. And the following physical phenomena need to take place uh, for it to become doped. So uh, an electronic charge, typically a hole gets injected from the metal to the polymer film. It needs to be transported through the volume of the polymer. At the opposite side, an ion gets injected and transported, and the two combine to give rise to the doped state. And we started putting together energy level diagrams. And of course, this phenomena have to be considered um, in the context of uh, the uh, changes they cause to the local electric field and the band structure of the polymer. But this provides a framework for analyzing this effect. And there are many surprises here. For example, in the polymer P.PSS, I'll show you uh, again the video, the process proceeds in a way that is quite easy to understand. You have ions coming in and they change the color of the material as they proceed uh, to the other side. In the polymer I show below, uh, something else happens. Here, this is an undoped polymer that gets doped through injection of anions and holes. And if you see here, the behavior is more complex. You have a front that starts from the left to the right and then reverses location, uh, direction, and goes to the other side. So we can understand this phenomena through um, uh, looking into the band structure of the polymer. What happens here is um, it turns out, in this case, holes are slower than ionic carriers. So what happens is it's the ions that go in first in the material and start pulling holes towards filling the sample volume. And then when that is achieved up to a certain level, the front reverses direction. So the underlying physics here is that of band filling. As you fill up the um, low-lying states in the highest occupied molecular orbital, the one where holes are transported, um, you end up having a change in the mobility 
um, and you, you go into a regime where a high density of states allows the holes to move faster than ions. Um, this is supported by measurements of hole mobility in uh, organic transistors that show the hole mobility to undergo massive uh, changes in magnitude upon doping. There are other interesting phenomena. For example, if we analyze the um, amount of current that is carried by drift versus diffusion, we find that electronic and ionic carriers seem to obey a different uh, uh, relationship. While cations um, conform to uh, any ion would conform to the Einstein uh, um, equation between uh, drift and diffusion, electronic charges behave differently and show enhanced diffusion um, as shown in this experiment. Happy to go into the details if there are questions. Let me end with something a bit more visual and uh, perhaps more practical. Um, the uh, field of soft robotics is uh, getting a lot of attention these days. And one way you can build soft robots is to use what is called artificial muscles, where you take a conducting polymer film and you make a bilayer between it and a thin metal film. So as you polarize this structure electrically, ions can go into the polymer and change its volume. They can either swell it or um, when they come out, they can shrink it. And that gives rise to changes in the, um, um, in the um, uh, conformation of this uh, bilayer in space. For example, you can have um, bilayer structures that undergo quite extensive range of motion as, sh as shown here. Now, these have been um, mostly an experimental curiosity and a way to study the electromechanical properties of polymers. Um, you can show that uh, you can make actuators that undergo very strong motions uh, and, uh, uh, and quite repeatedly. And here we put them to use for, um, um, for neuroscience applications. Uh, this is a device that is engineered to do this helicoidal type of motion and as a result to wrap around the nerve. So we use these devices to intraoperatively monitor nerves, something which is, uh, there is a clinical need for this in, uh, in surgery. Um, the device is shown here to conform to a nerve and then when we gently press the paw of the animal to monitor health of the nerve um, in a non-invasive fashion. So with that, let me uh, wrap up. I hope I conveyed my enthusiasm by electronic medicine and how it could be used to treat uh, disease. Materials, new materials such as conducting polymers play a significant role in this endeavor. I showed the uh, work of Scott Keane, a very talented postdoc who looked into the physics of these uh, materials. And the work of Chao Chun Dong, another uh, talented postdoc who makes actuated electrodes with this technology. Let me thank my group, who are the, uh, the people who actually do the work, the collaborators uh, inside and outside Cambridge, funding agencies, a friend says, um, ideas without funding are hallucinations. So credit should go to funding agencies. And thank you for this honor. Thank you for your attention. Excellent presentation. We showed the, the, the historical route from electrical fishes to first pacemaker and watchmaker technologies. And we are glad to be living in the 21st century and with the benefit of the latest micro uh, electronic um, technologies. So, are there some questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think if you look around the, the, um, the people who are here then, I, I guess we're probably all over 40, I would think. And um, of course, one of the problems you get as you get older is that you lose cartilage in, in different joints, I mean, your knees and your hips. And what is, what is the position with the generation or the production of, of cartilage which can be used in, in, in your, in the, I mean, mainly knees and, and hips, yeah. really? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. It hasn't been explored much. There is evidence that electrical stimulation can help regenerate tissues 
but I'm not aware of anyone looking at cartilage. People looked at bone, people looked at, of course, neuronal tissues, looked at uh, muscle. Uh, cartilage hasn't attracted much attention, and, and this is a very good observation. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, also a major problem for the yeah. for the National Health Service. I mean, having hip replacements and knee replacements. Yeah. No, this I mean, is, this uh, takes a lot of uh, resources from the National Health Service. Indeed, it is usually tissue engineering that is uh, used to address these issues. People try to either take uh, uh, tissues from an animal, decellularize them, and then uh, bring them into humans. Um, or build synthetic analogs. Uh, bioelectronics hasn't been employed to this end, and uh, it should, it really should. Um, last question, maybe? Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. okay, please. Me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> George, that was wonderful. I enjoyed that. Uh, Thank you. What kind of problems, uh, if you work in vivo, in terms of the changes in the electrolyte of the surrounding Fluids. Does that cause problems, for example, with these uh, potential muscle devices and so on? Yeah, so the, um, there are issues when you bring a device into the body, and the, uh, the, it's what does the uh, device do to the body and what the body does to the device. Turns out uh, organic materials are more robust on the long term inside the body than inorganic ones. For example, silicon etches at a rate of about a micron, I think, a month um, inside the brain. Um, of course, it's covered with an oxide, that oxide undergoes hydrolysis, and uh, at the end, the device will erode. So a thin film device will not last very long. While these uh, uh, plastic-based materials um, would not degrade in the body. Um, then there is a question of what the electronics does to the body, that's a more complicated one. Typically, there is a scar that is built around the device and decreases performance over time. But there are strategies uh, evolved to uh, mitigate that to a large extent. Last question by very very First of all, it was impressive. So I won't Thank say you. more adjective, that's not impressive. Okay. And concerning the Parkinson, is there close to, to, I mean, to use uh, in general or in the market, if they were? Yeah, it, it is used. There are people who have been implanted 20 years ago. The devices still work. So in the um, UK, the NHS supports this treatment after the administration of dopamine has ceased to work. So it's a second line of defense. The first one is pharmaceuticals, and then uh, this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we will move now to the to the second presentation of this section. It will be the breast Pascal Medal for the Health Division, and uh, the recipe is Professor Patrick Kufrer. And the introducer will be Professor Daniel Sherman that will make both by Zoom. <coughs> okay, <laughs> do you hear me? Uh, yes, we yeah. hear. Uh, we hear. Okay. First of all, I was impressed by the former presentation. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Patrick Couvreur. And uh, I apologize for not being able to be here with you. So, uh, Patrick Couvreur was awarded the Blaise Pascal Medal of Medicine and Life Science for this year. And as you will see, uh, this is fully deserved. He is a widely recognized uh, seminal scientist in the field of nanotechnologies for drug delivery and imaging sciences. This is fully attested by the fact that Professor Couvreur belongs to the French Academy of Science, Technology, Pharmacy and Medicine. Uh, he is also international uh, member, foreign member of National Academy of Science of America, of National Academy of Engineering of USA, of the Royal Academy of Medicine of Belgium, of the Spanish Academy of Pharmacy. He has uh, held several ERC grants and he has been member of the ERC board. So let's go to, to the science. Uh, Professor Cooper has been pioneering the field of uh, biomaterials for nanomedicines, and as you know, this is a very active and uh, <coughs> actual topic. 
because of COVID-19 uh, vaccines. He has introduced the for the first time the design of polyacrylamide nanoparticles or nanocapsules for the intracellular delivery of compounds which cannot diffuse normally into the cell. Such uh, delivery agents were able to deliver uh, anti-cancer compound and to overcome the multidrug resistance in cancer. And this led to a revolutionary new anti-cancer medicine uh, that went into uh, completed phase three clinical trial. The name of the compound is Livatag R. And uh, other important polyalkyl uh, cyanoacrylate nanocapsules for the oral delivery of insulin have been proposed by Professor Kuhl. The exceptional inventive and contribution of Professor Kuhl is further demonstrated by the introduction of uh, a new technology, the squalene grafting of two drugs, which leads to self-forming biodegradable nanoparticles able to deliver a high amount of drugs to various tissues. This squalenoylation uh, is a self-assembling platform and it represents a rupture technology which could uh, have several applications in cancer, infection, pain treatment, and uh, a very dreadful uh, non-neuromuscular uh, rare disease, Sarcomaritus 1A, a rare, uh, very interesting uh, proof of concept in animals has been obtained for this uh, orphan drugs. Or orphan disease. Just to summarize uh, the uh, quantitative uh, research uh, main uh, achievement of uh, Patrick, uh, he has uh, published uh, 578 international publications, including Nature Materials, Nature Communication, Science, PNAS, and so on, and given to Kemi. He has uh, 121 review articles on book chapters, 94 patents more than 380 plenary lectures in international meeting, authorship of eight books. He has a, a web science uh, index of 105. Uh, he has been quoted 53,000 times and he is among the highly cited researchers of web of science. So uh, I am honored uh, to have uh, Patrick Coover as a Blaise Pascal's uh, recipe in our division this year. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for this uh, kind presentation. I will. Uh, I am very sorry not to be able to be uh, in Madrid at the moment because uh, of another commitment at the Academy of Science this morning. I am so sorry. So I will uh, try to share my screen. So thank you very much, uh, first of all, to uh, Professor Daniel Sherman also, of course, to the uh, European Academy of Science for uh, giving me this uh, Blaise Pascal medal. I am very honored and very pleased about that, especially because it will give me the uh, opportunity to uh, deliver this talk on the squalene-based nanomedicine for the treatment of uh, severe disease. First of all, what is a nanomedicine? In fact, a nanomedicine is a drug that was uh, uh, that is encapsulated into a nanocarriers with a size in between a few ten to a few hundred of nanometers, almost same size than the viral particles. And these encapsulation processes allow to protect the drug from the fast metabolization, to target in a highly specific manner the diseased cells and uh, tissues and also to improve the intracellular delivery of drugs. And one example, of course, is the uh, uh, COVID vaccination using the encapsulation of messenger RNA. But in general, when you are encapsulating a drug in a current nanocarriers, including liposomes or nanoparticles, you are using a physical encapsulation processes. This means encapsulation, entrapment, absorption, etc., etc. And these results, as you can see here, to a very poor drug loading. Only a few percent of the drug if compared to the amount of the transporter material. And the second limitation is that after administration of the nanomedicine, you will have an 
uncontrolled burst release of the drug, which is due to this fraction of the drug, as you can see here, which is rather absorbed at the surface of the nanomedicine than really encapsulated into its core. And to overcome those two limitations, we have decided a couple of years ago to move from the physical encapsulation to the chemical encapsulation uh, uh, paradigm. In other words, to do chemistry instead of uh, physics. And to do that, we have used this squalene. Why the squalene? Because it is uh, a natural and biocompatible lipid, which is, uh, as you know, in the mammalians, a precursor of the biosynthesis of the cholesterol. And amazingly, these natural lipids adopt in water, as you can see here, a folded conform, a molecular folded conformation. And we have taken advantage of this compact conformation of the squalene in water to link several drugs to the squalene used as a transporter molecule. And very amazingly, after putting this uh, uh, squalene drug bioconjugate into water, by supramolecular chemistry, the molecules will be able to self-assemble as nanoparticles with a size of around 100 nanometers and with a much higher drug loading than after using a physical encapsulation process, just because, as you can see here in this cartoon, each molecule of the squalene will be able to transport at least one, mole uh, one molecule of the uh, uh, drug. And also, you will have an absence of burst release just because you have a chemical link here in blue between the drug from one side and the squalene uh, from the other side. And also, if you are a good chemist, you can design a biocleavable uh, linker which will be able to respond to a specific endogenous stimulus which will allow the liberation, the release of the drug in a specific manner in the target cells or tissues or even subcellular compartments. I would like to illustrate that first uh, with some examples in the field of the uh, uh, treatment of cancer. As you can see here, we have linked the doxorubicin, which is a major anti-cancer compound, with the uh, uh, squalene, as you can see here. And after putting this bioconjugate into water, you can see that we obtained uh, elongated nanoparticles with a size of around 100 nanometers. But what is very interesting is that after intravenous administration, you can see that those nanoparticles will provide much higher concentration of the uh, uh, squalene doxorubicin uh, uh, products as compared to what was obtained here in red after administration of the doxorubicin as a free drug. And this will completely change also the overall biodistribution of the doxorubicin when administered as a nanoparticles. You can see that you will be able to dramatically decrease the concentration of doxorubicin at the level of the heart tissue, uh, comparatively here in blue to what happens with, after the administration of doxorubicin as a free drug. And this is very important because you know that the cardiac toxicity is the major limiting toxicity uh, in the clinic uh, uh, of uh, uh, doxorubicin. Then also you can see that after intravenous administration of the squalene doxorubicin nanoparticles, you will be able to increase significantly the concentration of doxorubicin into the tumor, comparatively to the free drug 24 hours after the administration. And the result of that was an increased pharmacological activity that we have demonstrated into preclinical uh, models of a human uh, pancreatic cancer and also a marine lung cancer. You can see here in green that after administration of the uh, doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles, uh, you completely inhibit the tumor growth comparatively to what happens here 
in red. Uh, after administration of the doxorubicin as a free drug, you can see that there was practically no inhibition of the tumor growth comparatively in black to the untreated animals because the doxorubicin is clearly, the, the, cancer, the cancer cells are clearly resistant to uh, doxorubicin as a free drug. And uh, from the point of the toxicity, we investigated the toxicity on the rat hypertensive uh, model. And you can see here in red that after administration of the doxorubicin as a free drug during uh, 11 weeks, once a week, at the uh, dose of one milligram per kilo body weight, there was a huge increase of the troponin, which is a marker of the cardiac toxicity. And at the end of this treatment, uh, by taking some cardiac biopsies of those animals who survived to the uh, cardiotoxicity of the doxorubicin, by looking to the histology, you can see that there was a very, very strong vacuolization of the cardiomyosis. And this is also, of course, a marker of the toxicity of doxorubicin. No. If you are administering the doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles uh, as nanoparticles at the same equivalent dose of doxorubicin or even at the double of the dose, you can see very clearly that the level of the troponin is absolutely normal and also the histology after biopsy of the cardiac tissue were also uh, normal whatever was the dose. Now, the question was, how are those uh, uh, squalene doxorubicin nanoparticles able to target the cancer cells in a specific manner? Well, to investigate that, we investigated the interaction of uh, squalene doxorubicin, of squalene gemcitabine nanoparticles, another anti-cancer compounds, with squalene cisplatin nanoparticles, with the blood, in vitro after incubation with the human blood, and in vivo, as you can see here, after intravenous administration to rats. And very surprisingly, we observed that the squalene anti-cancer drug nanoparticles very rapidly disaggregated in the presence of the blood, allowing the liberation of the, here, the uh, squalene gemcitabine or squalene uh, uh, doxorubicin, as a single molecular entities. And because of the squalene moiety, which is a precursor once again of the biosynthesis of, of the uh, cholesterol, those uh, molecular entities will have a very strong affinity for the cholesterol rich lipoprotein. And the uh, doxorubicin squalene, gemcitabine squalene as molecule, will insert uh, into the LDLs, into the human blood. And this will allow to target the cancer cells. Why? Because you know that at the level of the cancer cells, you have the hyperexpression of the LDL uh, receptors just because the cancer cells need to feed with a lot of lipids to make membrane and to multiplicate. And so by this way, you see that those uh, squalenolated uh, nanoparticles are using the LDL as a uh, uh, endogenous uh, uh, vehicles for the uh, specific targeting of cells with a uh, high expression of the LDL receptors, including the uh, uh, cancer cells. Now, I would like to move to some application in the treatment of uh, neurological disorders by developing using the same nanotechnology nanoparticles which don't need to pass through the blood-brain barrier, but to act essentially on peripheral receptors. The first example is uh, adenosine, because you know that it is an important uh, uh, molecule uh, in the energetic metabolism producing the ATP. It is a neuromodulator, and normally this molecule uh, should have pharmacological efficacy in several neurological disorders, including the stroke, the brain ischemia. But unfortunately, it is not the case because you know adenosine is very rapidly metabolized after intravenous administration with a half-life of only 10 seconds. 
And in fact, this is due, as you can see here, to the rapid deamination of the amino group of adenosine by the blood deaminases. And uh, uh, in fact, to protect the adenosine from this fast metabolization, we have linked here in green the squalene through the squalenic acid uh, to the amino group of adenosine. And after putting the adenosine squalene uh, prodrug into water, we obtained once again uh, nice nanoparticles, spherical shape with a size of around 100 nanometers. And we have tested those nanoparticles uh, for the treatment of brain ischemia by inserting, as you can see here, a filament in the right carotid of uh, uh, mice. And this will induce, as you can see here, an infarct uh, uh, volume. And you can see that after administration of adenosine as a free drug, there was absolutely no diminution of the infarct volume comparatively to the only vehicle treated animals. But after the administration of the adenosine squalene nanoparticles, either here pre-ischemia at two doses, or even post-ischemia, or even after 24 hours permanent occlusion, you can see that there was a very strong diminution of the uh, infarct volume, and clearly we provided a very uh, dramatic neuroprotection. And we investigated the mechanism behind this uh, neuroprotection uh, by performing some biodistribution studies, and we observed very clearly that those nanoparticles were absolutely unable to translocate through the blood-brain barrier and to reach the brain tissue. But on the contrary, as you can see here in this pharmacokinetic, the adenosine squalene uh, uh, remains into the blood circulation uh, uh, with a long uh, blood circulation time. And in fact, uh, uh, this allowed to interact with the adenosine A to B receptors, which are located at the level of the brain vessels micro uh, circulation of the microcirculation. And this interaction with the adenosine A to B receptors will induce vessel relaxation, as you can see here, with a decrease of the number of ischemic capillaries comparatively to the uh, untreated animals. And this will induce a better perfusion and the observed neuroprotection once again without passing through the blood brain barrier. And by following the same way of uh, reasoning, we uh, start to be interested to pain alleviation. Why? Because you know that pain alleviation is a major medical uh, concern especially because the treatment with morphine and opioid derivatives results uh, in the long run to tolerance, dependence, and then finally addiction. And this is a major problem in Europe, also in the uh, USA, where it is really a national crisis with 11 million of patients which are addicted to opioid derivatives. And in fact, a very attractive option is to use some endogenous neuropeptides like endorphins or encephaline. Because those molecules are not inducing tolerance and addiction because they are acting on the delta opioid receptors, on the contrary to morphine, which is acting on mu uh, receptors. But unfortunately, this approach is not working because the endorphin and the encephaline are very rapidly metabolized with a half-life of only uh, a, a few minutes. And to overcome this problem, as you can see here, we have synthesized a small library of leoncephaline squalene uh, bioconjugates uh, using uh, various chemical uh, linker, the oxycarbonyl or diglycolic or amide, and after putting those bioconjugates into water, you can see that we got once again nice nanoparticles with a size in between 70 and 120 uh, nanometers. 
And we have tested those nanoparticles on a model of uh, uh, inflammatory pain, which was induced by the injection of carrageenan in the right paw of rats, inducing a swelling of the paw, as you can see here, very painful. And after treatment with those long kephalin squalene nanoparticles, you can see here in blue that we obtained a long lasting pain alleviation that was not observed after the administration of the le encephaline as a, a, a free a drug, as a free a molecule. And then to investigate the mechanism behind that, we have performed some imaging studies that you can see here after labeling uh, of those uh, long kephalin squalene nanoparticles with a fluorescent dye. And you can see that after intravenous administration, over the time, there was a, a concentration, a targeting of those nanoparticles at the level of the right painful inflammatory pow. You have a magnification here. And there was no access for those nanoparticles to the left healthy pow, uh, which was used as a control. And in fact, this is explainable by the fact that at the level, as you can see here, of the inflammatory painful tissue, you have a leaky vasculature, which allow those Le encephalin squalene nanoparticles to extravasate in a highly specific manner at the level of the uh, inflammatory tissue and to release the intact neuropeptide at this level. Whereas, as you can see here, uh, those nanoparticles were unable to pass the blood-brain barrier and to enter into the brain tissue. And this is for this reason that those nanoparticles allowed uh, to obtain a pain alleviation, but without addiction, as it is observed with morphine or other opioid derivatives. Now, I would like to finish my presentation by showing you that this technology allows also to design multidrug nanoparticles for the treatment of paradoxical uh, inflammation associated, for instance, as you know, as a severe uh, COVID. You know that the inflammation starts in general with a strong activation of lymphocytes and neutrophils which will transmigrate into the tissues, for instance, the lung tissue, and this will induce the liberation of a lot of cytokines, of chemokines, of reactive oxygen spaces, inducing tissue injury due to the oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress will uh, accelerate the inflammatory process. And we have tried to inhibit this uh, vicious cycle between inflammation and oxidative stress by the design of multidrug nanoparticles, which will combine from one side adenosine through adenosine squalene, because adenosine can interact also with the adenosine, as you can see here, A2A receptors, which is inducing an anti inflammatory process. And it is very uh, easy to dissolve the vitamin E uh, into the lipophilic core of those nanoparticles, which will act as an antioxidant fighting against the oxidative uh, stress. And you can see that on an endotoxemia uh, model, this allowed to decrease uh, dramatically the uh, inflammation process you can see that here in blue, after administration of the multidrug nanoparticles, we had a decrease of the TNF alpha in plasma, which is, of course, a pro inflammatory uh, a cytokine comparatively to all the other controls, including the uh, uh, single uh, administration of a cocktail of the free drugs. And we observed also a decrease of MCP1 and EL6, which are also uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines at the level of the inflammatory uh, tissues, including the lungs, where you can see very clearly from the histology that there was a decrease of the inflammatory process comparatively to the untreated animals. On the other side, 
uh, we observed that the resolution of the uh, inflammation was also improved, as you can see here in blue, through an increase of the EL10, which is an anti-inflammatory uh, 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 cytokine. And the result of that was, the, was that those multidrug nanoparticles uh, in this uh, endotoxemia uh, model allowed to obtain 100% of the survival, whereas they were only 60% after treatment of the uh, adenosine and vitamin E free drug cocktail, and only 40% for the uh, untreated uh, animals. Now, I hope as a conclusion that I have uh, convinced you that advanced nanomedicine, and this is just one example, can protect drugs from fast metabolization. This was shown with adenosine. This was shown also with molecules uh, uh, like uh, uh, neuropeptides, but we, we did the same also with uh, uh, a small uh, interfering RNA. Those nanoparticles are able to target the diseased area through uh, enhanced permeability and retention effect when you have an inflammatory process or by using the LDL as indirect nanocarriers in case of tumors. And you can combine in the same nanotechnology different uh, 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 drugs, uh, like uh, it was shown for the treatment of the uh, uh, paradoxical inflammation. And I had not the time to develop this point, but you can also uh, uh, add an imaging uh, functionality in the same nanoparticles uh, to do Terranostic. And I would like to finish by acknowledgement of all the people of my group who collaborated more or less to one or another example I have given to you. And especially also, uh, I would uh, acknowledge uh, the European Research Council for giving me two grants allowing to develop this uh, squal annihilation uh, uh, technology. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. So, now, uh, I think it was a fantastic uh, uh, trade-off about what we can do on nanomedicine combined with uh, uh, nanomed uh, nanomaterials. And, in fact, is a topic that really shows how multidisciplinarity impacts on our lives and on the quality of what we want for, for all of us. Thank you very much. So, uh, now it's open for, for questions, please. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. And I had a question. Early on, you said that the squalene uh, nanoparticles can contain more of the active drug than a liposome. And I assume that's for the smaller liposomes, because uh, 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 you would think that uh, with the large liposomes, the uh, capacity would be a much greater than these squalene particles. But the other advantage of the liposomes is that the drug is protected from interaction with the biological fluids before it gets to the target, whereas in the squalene, I assume it's also exposed to the biological fluids. Okay, thank you for the question. Now, in fact, uh, uh, we did uh, a comparison, and you can find that in the different publication we did with uh, different compounds that the drug loading was much higher with the uh, 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 squal annihilation technology just because you are doing a prodrug and you can link one, even several uh, uh, molecules of the drug with the squalene used as a transporter material. With the liposomes in general, you are doing physical encapsulation processes. This means you have a lot of phospholipids and other lipids, of course, cholesterol, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you are in encapsulating drugs like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, adenosine or other hydrophilic compounds in the uh, hydrophilic core of the uh, uh, liposome. So the drug loading is much higher with the uh, uh, squalene, and we have demonstrated that with a lot of compounds, including with the uh, uh, small interfering uh, RNA and the uh, uh, nucleic acids and other uh, hydrophilic uh, compounds. Now, your second question, 
uh, is of course very important. This is the exposition of the drug after linkage with this quantum. In fact, we did a lot of studies by uh, uh, doing uh, some uh, X-ray uh, uh, diffraction studies, a small angle scattering to see the supramolecular organization of those nanoparticles. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in CERN, it depends on the drug. Uh, if the drug is more or less amphiphilic or lipophilic, it will concentrate in the core of the uh, nanotechnology. If you have a hydrophilic compound, you will have the biggest proportion still into the core, but you have, that's true, some molecule at the surface. It depends on the supramolecular organization. Sometimes we have uh, inverted hexagonal phases. Sometimes we have uh, bilayered structures. Sometimes also uh, cubic structures. It depends on the structures to see what is the amount of drug at the surface or in the core of the nanotechnology. So, uh, any other question, please? Can I, can I ask you a question? Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, I wanted to know why uh, with the anti-cancer uh, drug, um, mm. this uh, squalene nanoparticle seems to dissolve very fast uh, into LDL, while with the uh, anti-pain peptide, uh, it seems to keep a nanoparticle uh, shape and uh, be able to extravasate only in an inflammatory uh, zone of the body. This is, of course, a very, very good question. In fact, we have observed that with the uh, small molecules like uh, uh, cisplatin, like uh, adenosine, like doxorubicin, in fact, and for us, it was a real surprise. In fact, the nanoparticles dissolve, disaggregate very, very quickly. Just because uh, uh, you have a partitioning coefficients between the nanoparticles and the LDL. And because, as you know, the cholesterol has a very strong, the, the squalene, which is a precursor of the cholesterol, has a very, very strong uh, affinity for the LDL, uh, the partitioning coefficient is in favor of the LDL. No. If you are taking, for instance, small interfering RNA or peptides, or we did it also with a, a protein, uh, uh, we have, in that case, much uh, uh, larger molecules with higher molecular weight. You have probably, and we published that, uh, 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 some stacking process, and uh, uh, especially with the nucleic acid, you have also hydrogen bonds uh, uh, between the... Uh, uh, active principle, and this makes probably that the uh, uh, particles are uh, uh, more uh, resistant to the disaggregation. Okay, thank so you. thank you very much, and let's thanks to the speaker again. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and honor to hear. Thank you for me too, for me too. Okay. So let's move for the last um, award of this morning, which is the best Pascal Award on the physics. And the presenter will be made by uh, head of division, Professor Paul Koch. Okay. Uh, last but not the least medal ceremony of the day. And, and, uh, anyhow, uh, at the end, when, after this one, we will take a join a join a picture. Picture, okay. Yeah, okay, good. So indeed, this is a, a great pleasure and, uh, and an honor for me to present the 2023 Blaise Pascal Medal uh, from the Physics Division to Professor Ricardo Betti for uh, his outstanding contribution to high temperature plasma physics with application to nuclear fusion and uh, for the development of the novel shock ignition approach uh, to direct drive inertial confinement fusion. Professor Ricardo Betti is an eminent scientist from the University of uh, Rochester and one of the most prominent protagonists in uh, the international arena uh, related to the study of the physics of laser produced plasmas and inertial confinement. He is considered as the father of the shock ignition approach to inertial confinement fusion, 
which recently demonstrated at the National Ignition Facility at Livermore that the 3.15 megajoule energy release from the triggered nuclear fusion reaction largely exceeded the 2.05 megajoule energy of the laser drive. Some of you could enjoy his very interesting and brilliant talk yesterday, which uh, hopefully convinced you, I'm sure, that uh, is one of the most prominent figures on the international scene of uh, inertial fusion. I am certain that the 2023 Blaise Pascal Medal of the Eurask uh, Physics Division will nicely complement the Landau Spitzer Award from the American and European Physical Societies, the Edward Taylor Medal from the American Nuclear Society, and the Ernest Orlando Lawrence Award from the US Department of Energy, he already received in recognition for, it, uh, for his uh, outstanding contribution to the inertial fusion science. Professor Betty, after the presentation of the medal, we are eager to learn from you how your work will contribute to solve one of the most important challenges of the modern world, which is to provide green energy to up to 10 billion people in hopefully a near future. Thank you. So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for the generous introduction. And uh, uh, also, I would like to thank the European Academy of Science, the President and the Vice President uh, for the honor uh, for the Blaise Pascal Medal. I'm honored to be here. I'm really very pleased also to be part of this symposium and also to visit this wonderful city. I haven't been in Madrid for about 20 years, so thanks for the opportunity. So uh, yesterday I talked about the achievements uh, at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory on demonstrating for the first time thermonuclear ignition in the laboratory. Uh, and that was a very recent achievement uh, of the last uh, year or so. Uh, now I'll talk about how to turn uh, the challenges of turning uh, that physics principle demonstrated in the laboratory into a useful energy source. So first, a little bit of contest uh, that, uh, uh, for uh, laser fusion. So laser fusion uh, uh, really was heavily uh, uh, funded by the United States government uh, for national security purposes, not for energy. Uh, it, it was heavily funded since the 1990s uh, for uh, what is called a science-based program to maintain uh, the stockpile of nuclear weapons in the United States. So the, with the end of nuclear testing, uh, the United States government decided that uh, we can maintain the nuclear stockpile using uh, a scientific uh, uh, method of uh, looking at all the different aspects of a nuclear device uh, uh, separately, scientifically, without the need of testing the nuclear device. And so the program uh, was uh, started in 1994, and then the National Ignition Facility at uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, was uh, uh, broke ground in 1997. So, and it was uh, designed to uh, demonstrate thermonuclear ignition in the laboratory as part of the stockpile stewardship program. 
So, uh, so the size of NIF, uh, the NIF is so big, as I said yesterday, the size of three football fields uh, because it's a $4 billion facility. And that because uh, that's what you need to demonstrate thermonuclear ignition. You need a very big laser. Uh, now, the applications to energy of that uh, have been reviewed by different uh, uh, um, institutions uh, like the U.S. National Academy of Science. Uh, the last review was in 2013. I was part of the panel. And uh, most recently, uh, in 2023, uh, there was another review. Uh, it wasn't actually a review, it was mostly like uh, uh, an attempt to organize an effort uh, to uh, uh, look into laser fusion for energy application. And that is uh, described in the report uh, uh, by the Department of Energy, the BRN report. The BRN stands for Basic Research, Research Needs uh, and is available online. Uh, and uh, in 2013, the National Academy of Science, uh, the US National Academy of Science, uh, recommended that uh, the Department of Energy should start a national inertial fusion energy program as soon as ignition is demonstrated. Since ignition was demonstrated uh, very recently, then uh, the United States Department of Energy decided, well, shall we start the program then? Uh, so, so I will talk about the energy applications now uh, of laser fusion. So laser fusion is done in the United States. In the United States, uh, uh, comes in two flavors. Uh, one is called direct drive, and one is called indirect drive. The one I described yesterday is indirect drive. It's mostly done at Lawrence Livermore on the NIF laser, which is a two megajoule uh, laser in the UV uh, with a power of 500 terawatts. Uh, direct drive. Uh, direct drive. Uh, you can see it's different than indirect drive because the laser is shined directly on the capsule, uh, unlike indirect drive where the laser beams uh, shine inside this cavity uh, made of gold or depleted uranium. So this uh, direct drive is studied in my institution at the University of Rochester on the Omega laser, uh, a, a, a laser that is much smaller than an IF laser, is uh, 30 kilojoules rather than two megajoules and at 30 terawatts, terawatts of power, but it's still a very large laser. <laughs> it's, uh, if to build the Omega laser this day, it probably cost around $300 million. It's the size of a football field, like the NIF is three football fields. Okay, so for a university, that is a very large institution, a very, very large facility. Uh, there are other lasers in the world, uh, all mostly uh, funded for national security. Uh, one is in France, uh, the laser Megajoule. Uh, that is almost completed. Uh, that's close to the size of the NIF. Uh, and then uh, there is SG3 in China. Uh, it's intermediate in size between the NIF and the Omega laser at Rochester. is under 80 kilojoules of energy at 60 terawatts of power. And they can do both. They can do direct drive, which is shining the laser directly on the capsule, and indirect drive, shining the laser inside the cavity and making x-rays that drive the implosion. So what's the difference between direct drive and indirect drive? Well, first of all, uh, the fact that uh, you shine the laser directly on the capsule, you are not wasting energy making x-rays because uh, the laser goes directly to generate a pressure on the surface of the capsule. Uh, so the efficiency is higher. Indeed, the capsules that you will use uh, for indirect drive are smaller as the one on the left there. And uh, uh, compared to a direct drive capsule, which is the one on the right. So direct drive capsule will be roughly three and a half millimeter for the same en laser energy would be three and a half millimeter in diameter, like the indirect drive capsule used on NIF nowadays at two millimeters in diameter. Uh, there is another benefit of direct drive capsules, uh, which is uh, that uh, uh, the ablator, which is uh, uh, a shell of plastic that you see the other shell, uh, is uh, very thin. Uh, and instead, for indirect drive, uh, since you're using x-rays, is very thick. And uh, you, uh, when you shine, so the x-rays do not uh, ablate completely the ablator, 
because you need the sum ablator left in order to protect uh, the deuterium and tritium, which is the thermonuclear fuel, from the X-rays. So instead, the direct drive uh, doesn't need that protection, so you can ablate all the ablator, and then what you are left is uh, just the, the thermonuclear fuel. So that's also an advantage. So just to give you a comparison between direct drive and indirect drive. So on the left is uh, the Omega laser direct drive uh, used at Rochester. That's a typical target. Uh, we, we shoot a target uh, with roughly 30 kilojoules of energy of laser light in the UV. And uh, the kinetic energy of the implosion uh, is roughly one and a half kilojoules. So that's the useful energy that then is used uh, to compress the fuel and generate the high pressure that then should bring the capsule to ignition. So if you divide the one and a half kilojoules of kinetic energy by the 20.85 kilojoules of laser energy, the ratio is 5.2%. So that means that there is roughly 5% of laser energy transformed into useful kinetic energy of the implosion. When you look at indirect drive, two megajoules of laser energy on the NIF produces 30 kilojoules of useful kinetic energy, and that is an efficiency of only 1.4%. So direct drive is a lot more efficient than indirect drive, and that because, as I said, you don't have to make x-rays, so you don't have that intermediate step. And in addition, indirect drive, you need a blade of remaining mass, which is roughly the size of the fuel mass. Instead, for direct drive, it's all fuel. So which implies that direct drive, in principle, as the potential for high energy gains with respect to indirect drive because it can drive an amount of fuel that is seven times larger than indirect drive. So in principle, for the same laser energy, you can have seven times more fusion energy out uh, in direct drive than in indirect drive. So let's look at indirect drive. The indirect drive I talked about it yesterday. Uh, where do they stand? Well, they have the, the, Lawrence, the Lawrence Livermore group had demonstrated ignition. Uh, I helped them uh, with the ignition metrics, uh, so which are metrics to determine how close to ignition you are. And remember, ignition is an instability. It's called the thermonuclear instability. So if you are below threshold of the instability, you almost have nothing. And if you are above threshold, you have a lot of energy output. Uh, so, uh, indirect drive uh, uh, has achieved ignition, demonstrated ignition, and with, uh, the, as, with uh, minor upgrades, uh, minor uh, in this business means, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, so, uh, with minor upgrades uh, can achieve uh, uh, probably tens of megajoules of fusion yield. Right now, the highest yield is roughly four megajoules. Uh, so that's the status of indirect drive. But let's talk about direct drive. Uh, uh, so direct drive is, as I said, is done on Omega, so a much smaller laser, by around 70 times smaller in energy. Uh, so on, on, on Rochester, with such a small amount of energy, we are not uh, uh, able to achieve ignition on Rochester. So the way uh, we uh, try to understand where we are in terms of performance we do an implosion, then we simulate that implosion, and the codes, uh, actually, they are always optimistic, so they tell you that things should look better than reality. Uh, and so what we do, we degrade the codes, uh, so this is kind of ad hoc, in order to reproduce the implosions that uh, we, uh, uh, the, all the measurables, uh, uh, the, all the observables that we measure in an experiment. And so at the end, in the codes, we have a condition of compressed core which matches all the observable in the experiments. So, and this is uh, the picture on the left shows a simulation that reproduces the compressed core, both density on the right and temperature on the left, of an omega implosion. So we, we, we now have a simulation that reproduces all the observables, and we take the simulations we make it bigger in size, because if we had a bigger laser, like the NIF, two megajoules, to do a direct drive, then uh, we would be able to implode a capsule that is roughly four times bigger. And you can see in the axis uh, uh, of the, on the right picture, the x-axis and the y-axis are roughly four times in scale with respect to the left pictures. So we make the, code, the capsule, the core, bigger in the codes, and then we see whether that ignites or it doesn't ignite. 
So that's where we are with direct drive. So with direct drive, if we take any implosions on the NIF rather than on the omega laser with two megajoules of laser energy shine directly on the capsule, then uh, we are very close to ignition with direct drive as well. As you can see, ignition is represented by the parameter chi, which is the Lawson parameter. When chi is one, you have ignition. And now you can see those are all the experiments on the omega laser. And it shows that today we are very close to chi equal one. Chi equal 0 0.9. So we need a 10% increase in chi in performance. The extrapolated fusion yield uh, for a two megajoule uh, of laser energy on the target will be roughly two megajoules right now. And uh, we think we probably are going to be above the gain equal one curve by the end of this week because we have experiments at the end of this week. So. Uh, you can see that it looks like direct drive and indirect drive for the same amount of energy are very close in terms of performance. Both of them, uh, uh, indirect drive has demonstrated ignition, direct drive uh, will demonstrate almost certainly hydroequivalent ignition uh, within the end of the year, if not the end of this week. So there are other schemes that I worked on, uh, as mentioned, the shock ignition scheme. Uh, so the shock ignition scheme is mostly a direct drive scheme. It uses uh, a shock at the end of the implosion in order to ignite the capsule. The shock, as you can see on the left, uh, is a plot of the laser power versus time. And the shock is launched uh, by a spike. Uh, it's called the igniter spike in laser power. So if you can time the shock uh, perfectly in such a way that uh, the shock that you launch at the end of the pulse collides uh, with the, what is called the return shock or rebound shock because when you implode the capsule, the capsule eventually stagnates and generates high pressure in the center and the high pressure in the center drives an outward going shock. So if you can push that outward going shock back in by launching an igniter shock at the end of the pulse, you can ignite the pellet. And so this is a scheme that can lead to very high energy gains useful for, for energy applications. Then there are other uh, ignition schemes that are under consideration, like the fast ignition scheme that uh, uh, uses instead the energetic particles accelerated by short pulse laser in order to ignite the capsule. So this is activities is done uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, shock ignition in Europe is, uh, uh, as uh, Europe has adopted shock ignition uh, as one of the main <coughs> schemes. And of course, it's worked at the University of Rochester and, uh, uh, and fast ignition in Japan. So what about uh, energy? So of course, fusion, uh, probably you heard uh, the story of fusion, uh, you know, as a lot of attractive features if it works, carbon free, abundant, uh, and the geographically diverse fuel, environmentally sustainable, possibly safe, ability to meet base load, can be generated in the air population center, flexible energy products, minimal proliferation concern, and, uh, uh, and diversification. So it's, uh, it's, the potential is tremendous. Uh, and there are some advantages of inertial fusion with respect to uh, magnetic fusions and disadvantages. Uh, some advantage is that uh, uh, is modular, so you can develop the, the pieces uh, separately. And there are multiple target concepts, so it's not just one concept. One concept doesn't work, you can look at another one. And uh, uh, as potential for spin-offs and uh, uh, as uh, multiple sponsor, because as we said, the sponsor also for national security, not just for energy. So this is how a nuclear power plant will look like based on fusion. So they would have a laser array to reduce the laser. I would have a target chamber, uh, final optics uh, for uh, get all the laser beams on, on targets, and uh, you know, for depending on the laser that you're using, it has to be uh, uh, frequency tripled or doubled. Uh, then it would have uh, blankets for tritium breeding, a target fat factory because you had to produce millions of targets uh, a day, uh, and then uh, a, 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 a uh, electricity or hydrogen generator uh, to, uh, uh, to, to for useful uh, uh, transformation of the energy uh, or the heat that uh, you produce. 
So, but remember, this is laser fusion now. Uh, so laser fusion now is what? So is the NIF. So in the NIF, you had to charge the capacitor banks with 400 megajoules uh, of electrical energy. Uh, then uh, they power the flash lamps. Then uh, uh, they make uh, uh, infrared light, uh, roughly four to five megajoule. Uh, the infrared light has to be frequency tripled to UV, and that uh, you lose about half of it. Uh, so you have two megajoules in the UV. Uh, then that goes into the whole realm, uh, that's indirect drive. And, uh, and then uh, roughly uh, 200 kilojoules gets absorbed uh, by the capsule inside the whole round, and only 30 kilojoules, uh, uh, 0.03 megajoules, uh, end up as kinetic energy of the implosion. And that makes uh, roughly four megajoules of fusion energy demonstrated on the NIF so far. And uh, of course, that's a target gain of, of two, but with respect to the energy in the capacitor bank, it's only a 1% of fusion energy with respect to the energy that you need uh, to charge the capacitors. So obviously we know this is, uh, of course, NIF uh, is not designed for energy application, it's designed for national security, so it's energy inefficient, uh, but uh, uh, if you don't care about the energy application, then uh, um, that's fine, you, you don't worry about that. So. So now let's worry about the energy application. So that's where we are now. Uh, that's, uh, this is where we need to get in order if we want to make energy out of this. So we need high gains on the target. So right now we have a, a, high, a gain of two. We need gains of hundreds in order to make it uh, energy efficient. Uh, and we need to repeat uh, uh, ever implosions uh, at uh, a rate of larger than 10 Hertz probably 10 to 15 hertz. So right now, the NIF uh, will shoot uh, 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 once or twice a day. Uh, Omega laser sh shoots about once every hour. Uh, and we need to get to 10 hertz. So we know how to make lasers that shoot at 10 hertz. Small lasers, not big lasers, but we know how to make the technologies there. So that is, you know, has to be developed for large laser systems. So we need to clear the target chamber at 10 hertz. We need to produ uh, mass produce targets at a cost of 10 to 15 cents a target. Right now, a NIF target, it will cost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we need to bring down the cost to 10 to 15 uh, cents a target if you want to make energy. Uh, we need to inject the target into the target chamber at a very high speed in order to survive, hundreds of meters a second. Uh, and that is a target that is cryogenic. Uh, with a liquid uh, DT in it. So we need to develop the first wall material. Uh, we need to breed the tritium uh, with uh, a breeding factor in excess of one, otherwise we don't have the fuel to power the power plant. And we need to produce that uh, with a competitive cost. Uh, of, uh, it has to be competitive, the kilowatt hour, with other energy sources, in particular fossil fuel. So this is all a major challenge, as you can tell. So we know how to make uh, replicated lasers. The two major candidates uh, for laser drivers are either excimer gas lasers or diode pump solid state lasers. So the excimer gas laser has some advantages uh, uh, and some disadvantages. So the efficiency is not that high. Uh, diode pump laser is higher efficiency, can be up to 20% efficient. Right now the efficiency of the NIF is uh, a fraction of 1%. Uh, but uh, diode pump laser can be uh, very efficient, uh, 20 up to 20%. Uh, Excimer laser less efficient, roughly 10%. Uh, but uh, uh, they make light that is uh, uh, higher frequency, shorter wavelength, and that's good for the target physics. It can be uh, uh, as short as uh, 200 nanometers. And instead, diode pump laser has to be frequency triple, roughly at 350 nanometers. So, but, you know, they, I have, uh, although I'm not a laser engineer myself, I have a lot of faith in laser engineers. I know they can develop this kind of systems. Uh, more difficult is to make the targets. Uh, you had to make the targets cheaper uh, than what we do now. Yes, uh, much cheaper. And you had to make it in the millions. Uh, uh, right now, we make a target for the shot on NIF that we take once every few weeks. So instead, that now they had to be built uh, in mass-produced. There are techniques to do that, mostly foam targets, 
uh, they can be built very cheaply. Whether foam targets, uh, they're going to work for ICF, uh, we haven't demonstrated that yet. Uh, but there is you know, good reason to believe that they may work. So there are different techniques. I'm not going to go over that. And also, I'm not an expert really on target fabrication. This is a, uh, the domain of the chemists. Uh, but uh, uh, there are techniques to ma mass produce targets. Target injection, that's a, uh, there is very little work done on this. Uh, you had to inject the target at a very high speed, and then you had to track the target. Uh, so you need uh, uh, moving mirrors that can track the target, and you had to shoot the target precisely. You have a very little tolerance uh, 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 for shooting the target in terms of uh, positioning. It has to be positioned right at the center of the target chamber within uh, you know, a few tenths of a, a few tenths, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, about 10 microns, 10 or 20 microns. I mean, you cannot allow more than that. And the target chamber is probably 10 meters. So uh, those are the tolerance that we are talking about here. So the injection has to be 100 meters per second. Otherwise, the target will melt in flight and uh, the tracking has to be super accurate. So and there, we have very little work. Uh, to date uh, on the, the subject of injection and tracking of targets. Uh, to develop the materials, uh, the first wall materials, uh, that is something that is in common with magnetic fusion. So magnetic fusion, inertial fusion scientists can work together in that, material scientists. Uh, there, is, there are some differences though, because uh, inertial fusion uh, is uh, uh, pulsed, so at 10 Hertz. Uh, so the higher peak power and uh, also X-rays and ions, energetic ions hitting the wall. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, if you use lasers as driver, uh, you have the problem of the optics as to be protected. Uh, so there are several ch chamber concepts uh, that have been developed, uh, thick liquid walls, uh, dry walls, pre -pre -protect protected gas in it uh, to protect uh, from X-rays uh, and energetic particles. Uh, another area of, uh, in common between uh, uh, magnetic fusion and inertial fusion is uh, tritium engineering and science. Uh, actually, for, for magnetic fusion, it's even a, a, a very serious problem because magnetic fusion, at, let's say tokamaks, only burn 1% of the fuel. So you had to uh, make sure that you can recycle the 99% very accurately. Uh, instead, the burn-up fraction for inertial fusion is roughly 30%, so it's, uh, it's more forgiving in terms of recycling. And, uh, but uh, uh, remember that tritium is very expensive nowadays, $30,000 per gram, and that, of course, uh, the, all the processing of the tritium has to be done in a cost-effective way. So, uh, so a challenging, very challenging problem. Uh, so there is activity in the application, uh, in the energy application of inertial fusion. Uh, there was, uh, uh, a, as I mentioned before, a workshop that was sponsored by the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, I, I was a co-chair of this workshop uh, together with Dr. Tammy Mao, Lawrence Livermore. So there is a report on it uh, that you can download uh, that explain all the challenges and what needs to be done. Uh, about 120 people uh, were at the workshop and, uh, you know, what needs to be done is pretty clear. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, funding level, if depending, if you want to rely on fusion energy in, the, you know, 10 to 20 years, uh, uh, the investment has to be significant. So I'm going to end up my talk uh, with uh, uh, an optimistic view that uh, we have uh, a proof of principle that uh, we can ignite a pellet uh, in the laboratory and make uh, useful fusion energy out of that. Uh, we should try to look into the energy application, see if we can turn it into an energy source. The effort in the United States uh, to, to start activities in inertial fusion energy application uh, is, uh, I suggest to read that uh, pretty long report of the uh, workshop uh, uh, last year. Uh, there is uh, a memorandum from the German government, I was part of that too, uh, also that the uh, uh, German government is investing in inertial fusion. And uh, uh, I want to also acknowledge the talks uh, uh, yesterday by uh, Manolo Perlado and Luca Volpe on uh, a European plan uh, for inertial fusion energy. And with that, uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, now the talk is open for
And it's very interesting work, and I'm just curious, uh, how do you read tritium, and do you have to make it a, as an unneeded basis because of the short half-life? So you use a reaction with lithium, so, uh, so you can neutron a lithium uh, through a nuclear reaction, make tritium mm -hmm. in the sequence. And uh, the tritium, uh, uh, so you have to make sure that the breeding ratio, so you, to, make, uh, to make one neutron, you use one triton. And so that neutron then has to make uh, at least that triton, make up for the one you used. And actually you need a little bit more than that because there's always gonna be losses. So you have to make sure that the lithium blanket produces 1.1 tritons for every triton that is consumed in the plasma. And then you have to separate that? And, and then you have to separate that, okay. yes. Thank you.